Welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed the many exhibition and sponsor booths on offer and took advantage of the gap to put your silent auction bids in. You are tuned into Feeder 2 and we'd like to thank our gold sponsors, Rico, Canon, Toyota South Africa, Boundless Southern Africa and Swarovski Optic for supporting this exciting event. Up next, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome a man who is no stranger to Africa and who has been instrumental in unlocking our understanding of migratory raptors that moved between mainland Europe and Central Asia during the Northern Hemisphere summer and the African continent during the Southern Hemisphere summer. Dr. Patrick Byholm is a lecturer at the University of Helsinki in Finland, where he studies evolutionary biology and migratory bird behavior, often through the use of tracking birds. I've had the privilege of working closely with Patrick during his time in South Africa and seeing his incredible knowledge of raptors firsthand, most importantly on that of the European honey buzzard, which is the subject of today's talk. You are in for a real treat with this next presentation. So I'm gonna hand over to you, Patrick. Thanks so much for joining us. Hello everybody, and uh, welcome to listen to my talk about the migration of European honey buzzards into Africa. Uh, this is uh, something I've been studying, yeah, for more than 10 years now, actually, and uh, I will present some of the results we have obtained from this uh, project. Uh, my name, as I possibly already said, is Patrick Buhol, uh, and I'm affiliated to the University of Helsinki in Finland at the moment, but also to the University of Applied Sciences uh, in, in Finland as well. Uh, I gave this presentation together with my, my colleague, Wouter Van Steland, who is at the Donjana Biological Station at the uh, present, but is also affiliated to the University of Amsterdam. Okay, this is how the uh, research area looks like in, in Finland. It's boreal forest. Uh, it's uh, about, well, as, as almost as far north you can come in Europe, so Finland, this is uh, in the, uh, well, Scandinavia, you might know that, but in case you didn't know, now you know. This is the study object, uh, the honey buzzard, a close-up of its face. It's uh, perhaps not a super well-known uh, bird species uh, by by you, I don't know, but it's, it's a bird breeding in the Palearctic and migrating uh, then into Africa during the winter, the Nordic winter. It's widely distributed in the Palearctic in, the, in Europe, but also in Western Asia, uh, but it's declining in many parts of, of, of its distribution area, including Finland, actually to the, to the point now that it is uh, red listed nationally as endangered. Uh, and this is actually what this curve here, a mixture of, of Finnish and English, but anyway, it's a population trend curve uh, describing the population trend of the uh, European honey buzzard in Finland based upon on monitoring uh, census material collected since 1982. And as you can see, it's a steady, uh, pretty slow decline. Uh, and and uh, well, during these uh, 40 years or so, uh, almost or even more than half of the population has disappeared in Finland. Nobody really knows why, or at least they didn't knew before we started this project. And uh, as I will tell you soon, we, we have learned something. Uh, well, a few words still about the honey buzzard. Um, it's, it's a food specialist, so as the, the name kind of uh, infers already, it is interested in, in, in bees and wasps and actually not that in honey or and more, more also in wasps than in bees, but it uh, do eat bees, uh, both domestic and, and bumblebees and then uh, almost exclusively larvae of nests that it, it's uh, snatches from, from twigs or, or dig out from the ground. They also eat frogs to some extent, especially if they are, it's a bad wasp year and, and small uh, baby birds, uh, but it's not the kind of a fierce raptor. Yeah. 
in what we perhaps many people think consider a raptor to be. Uh, well, Finland, it's, it's a land of forest, as you already saw on my uh, first slide. Uh, when I started this project in 2011, uh, really little actually was known about why is the bird declining? I mean, it was declining already then. It had been declining for, for 30 years then. Now it has been declining for 40 years. One idea I had was that this must be somehow related uh, to the way we treat our forest in Finland. And what we do is that we cut a lot of our forest, uh, so uh, to the point that a lot of the uh, forest species, both plants and animals, are endangered, nationally endangered at the moment. This couldn't be good news uh, for the honey buzzard either. After all, it's a, it's a forest specialist. Uh, but on the other hand, we also know uh, that migrants and uh, you, the European buzzard then is, is a migrant, a very clear one, migrates a tropical migrant into Africa. And uh, this is a completely different data set. It's also from a completely different country. It's from, from UK. But it, what you could have a look on uh, preferentially first is, is or almost exclusively, is this um, uh, uh, violet trend line here. You can see it says this is migratory birds migrating into the humid zone. They seem to be declining a lot uh, more than many other groups. And the honey buzzard belongs to this group. It migrates into the uh, basically rainforest belt of Africa. So this is the UK data. Humid zone migrants are also declining in UK, it seems, as do the honey buzzard in Finland. Well, they don't have the same story about or history with, with the intense forestry in UK as in Finland. So perhaps there could also be some other reasons for this. Well, very little at least was, was known about the honey buzzard when we started this project uh, 10 years ago. It was by, by far, I would say, the, the least known raptor species in Finland. It's, uh, it's not an easy bird to see and not even to, to, to hear while well, it's almost mute. Uh, and anyway, it's also pretty rare. So that's uh, why it's difficult to study. Uh, some work has been done, of course, on honey buzzards still, uh, and uh, one important piece of work that was conducted, has been conducted, still is going on. It, it's, it's about to ring the birds. <clears throat> and uh, bird ringing in Finland actually st started already in 1913, so it has been going on for, well, more than 100 years now. And from a few uh, ring recoveries from, from Africa. It was known or based upon then, it at least was inferred that um, um, Finnish honey buzzards migrate to, to Western uh, Africa and, and also to Equatorial Africa, basically a, a belt from, from Guinea in the West uh, via Nigeria, Cameroon to down to uh, DRC. Uh, but this was material that has been accumulating very slowly. As I said, uh, 100 years of ringing, only 25 recoveries. So a pretty small material after all. So we all also wanted to confirm this. Is this really the case where the Finnish birds are uh, migrating to spend the Nordic winter? So what we did was that we equipped uh, a bunch of uh, honey buzzards uh, with trackers. Uh, we used different brands during the years uh, actively. We put new trackers on bird between 2011 uh, and 2016. Uh, altogether, uh, slightly more than 40 birds, most of them young, but we also caught uh, adults. And at the best, we could even get 
uh, GPS fixes, uh, basically at an accuracy of, of 10 meters or so, even better, uh, every 10 minutes from, from some of these devices. Others didn't deliver that much data, uh, so we, we could perhaps only get a, a few points a day. Anyway, here, here it, it's me sitting with the, the red <laughs> Red T-shirt you can can see under underneath my my blue shirt and and the uh, uh, local ringer <coughs> uh, that I I was working with Mikko Honginiemi helping me assisting to to find nests and help also to catch uh, adults that's not an easy task so we call adults uh, with nets but to to at the nest and uh, an efficient method to do that that is to well you have to kind of uh, well get the the adult to 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 fly into the net and to do that we use the stuffed eagle owl kind of harassing them to attack the owl in order to protect their chicks and then uh, getting stuck in the net but only about 20 percent uh, well of the attempts uh, succeeded. So uh, we also started then, as partly at least as a result of this, to put the trackers on, on, on young. So the bird breed uh, in trees, so we had to climb trees. And then, um, uh, well, basically the young were easy to, of course, to put the trackers on them. Just prior to fledging, we, we, we climbed the nest and, and took the took the, the nestling out of the nest and, and put the tracker on its back. So there we had a 100% success rate. While, while doing this work, of course, we also we collected uh, other materials like uh, morphometrics uh, and um, took blood samples and so on for different purposes. Here are just a picture of, of that process. And the funny thing with the honey buzzard is that it is polymorphic when it comes to coloration. So even even sibs in the in the same nest um, they can look very differently. Like you you can see here, you have a pale morph to the left and and a, a dark morph to the right. So it's it's pretty strange uh, system they have with this this coloration. Very little is known about how it is inherited and, and so on. Okay, as we put the trackers on, uh, data started to generate. Uh, here are some, some GPS fixes uh, from one bird uh, on site on the breeding territory in Finland. So these kind of most efficient devices, at, as I told you, they delivered uh, GPS fixes even up to every 10 minutes. And, and so you get a lot of data uh, when uh, well, with using this kind of trackers, uh, which of course makes it possible also to study habitat use locally. Now, but I won't talk about that now, but talk migration, that's the topic and, and the migration into Africa. Here's one of our birds that happened to stand in front of a, of a guy with a camera when leaving Finland in the uh, in September 2012. Uh, so sometimes we have these strange coincidences with, with people seeing our birds. You can you can see the antenna here on on its back. And this is what the data looks like. If you put the migration tracks on on, on a map, <clears throat> and this is just uh, part of, of our birds, as is, uh, you can see, it's 26 out of the 42 birds that we have uh, some sort of migration information about from altogether. As uh, some of, of the tracks or some of the birds, they have multiple tracks, uh, though. But anyway, it's it's. Uh, Going back to the to the ringing data, we in, just in a few years we kind of more than than doubled uh, the the information on you, they have got from uh, bird ringing. But uh, anyway, our tracking data basically also confirmed that uh, the wintering areas 
uh, of the European Finnish European honey buzzards. They are roughly at the same uh, place where the ring recoveries uh, were from, perhaps a bit le least, uh, less to the west. Then, uh, but of course, when talking about ring recoveries, you must remember that also factors like uh, human population density uh, affect even where you get, uh, well, the probability that you get a ring recovery from a densely populated country is, is much bigger, of course, than from somewhere in the, in the rainforest in, in DRC, for example. You might also see that one, one bird actually went even, even down to South Africa. So that's the, the world record, known world record over, over, um, over how long uh, European honey buzzard has migrated. Okay, what determines where the birds end up? I mean, it's, it's a huge variation. They end up all over. Africa, it seems, more at least, uh, more, more, more or least, at least. Um, it, it's, it's a very widespread, like especially in west eastern direction, but also north south. How come they all originate basically from the very small same region, 200 times 200 kilometer in Finland, but this is where they end up in Africa? How come? So what we started to study, well, we, have, we have finished um, a few scientific papers on this uh, migration um, aspects. I will briefly tell you the main results about them. And we started to look <coughs> at the migration of young birds. Uh, so how, when the young honey buzzards leave Finland for the first um, autumn after being hatched, they have to do this on their own because their parents, they initiate the migration before them. They just leave them in Finland to after, by the end of, of August, by the latest, they leave them. Uh, and then the young stay just for, for a few more weeks, two, three weeks perhaps in Finland before they start to migrate on their own. So they don't have any adults that guide them. And what we wanted then to understand is how, how do they really end up where they do end up. As you can see here on this map to the left, we have a quite bred, uh, broad spread in east-west uh, direction where they end up to. If we first took a, take a look at this zoom in, you can also see that this tracks, migration tracks have different colors. Well, you can see that in, in every map actually, but if the tracks are red, it means that there's an eastward wind blowing while the bird is migrating at that particular location. And if it, it's a blue uh, track, then there's a westward wind. So basically what we can already see here from the beginning is that we have, they already start to spread. Some birds spread to the west and that's especially when there's a west wind blowing, they go from Finland to Sweden. Others continue over Eastern Europe uh, to Estonia, and especially when there's an eastward wind. This continues all over Europe, so if there's an eastward wind, they tend to drift or be blown to the east slightly, more than the, if it's a westward wind. Same happens over the Mediterranean, and when reaching Mediterranean, they have already spread up to almost 2000 kilometers in, in east-west uh, while leaving Scandinavia, it's only about 1000 kilometer. When reaching Africa again, the wintering grounds where they settled for the first uh, autumn, it's over 3000 kilometers already spread. And uh, the most important factor that uh, explains this is, is the wind. So there, there's a, usually a very high west, uh, strong westward wind over the Sahara. And that's why you have a lot of blue uh, tracks when the birds are flying over the Sahara. And you can see that they, they are, are kind of heading uh, to the west. Of course, they, they go south, that, that's programmed in their genes, but exactly where they end up, uh, about 50% actually of of the, we can explain the 50% of the variation about uh, where they end up with 
with wind only, but also geography, as I, I basically or told you here, depending on where they leave, do they leave to the west or, or do they just go over Eastern Europe, it will also influence on where they uh, end up in Africa. But in, in, in some, uh, uh, it's wind that is important for the young Hannibal sets. They are not led by anyone. They are completely naive. They know how to fly. It's, it's we are, sh should go south. That's what they know. But uh, where they end up, it's wind. And then, of course, you can, can ask yourself, are the adults the same? Well, and to make a fairly long story short, uh, the answer is no. But, but here are three individuals. Uh, you might have already seen names of, we have nicknamed these birds basically just for fun, but also because it's more easy to keep track on them yourself if, if they have names. But what you can see here, you have dashed lines and intact lines. Dashed lines, they are autumn migrations. So while the bird, when the birds migrate from Finland to Africa, and then the intact lines are birds uh, lines when, when the birds return uh, from Africa to Finland in, in the Nordic spring. And uh, what you can see is that they're pretty conservative. <laughs> you can basically see two things. They tend to use the same route uh, every, uh, every autumn and every spring. Of course, there is variation. They, some birds have different spring uh, autumn roots than spring roots, and here, here you have some divergence also, uh, so, so it's not completely clear. Uh, and here you have an even more massive divergence. Mm, for some reason, this bird started to my one in, in, in one uh, spring, Nordic spring started to migrate along the uh, eastern route instead of this more typical or, or its usual route, but it was confronted with some very, very, very strong winds here. So that's why it most probably decided to, to fly into the unknown, but it, it eventually found back to Finland, although too late. Uh, so it didn't, it didn't succeed to breed that year because it's, it's female already had paired up with another male, the neighbor. So that's what happened, may happen if, if you are late. But anyway, to, to, uh, as I basically already said, but here you have it in text. Um, the, the adults are much more, you could call them conservative. Uh, they are they're very, uh, they used more or less the same roots in, in consecutive years, uh, meaning that they are much less impacted by wind. They, they travel more by memory or, or, or what, uh, yeah, they, they, they use the same roots that they, they always does. <clears throat> And what you also can actually see, I will go back, I didn't mention that, is a difference also to the, to the young that, well, here you have one flying over the Aegean Sea and, and the Mediterranean over Greece in, in autumn, but you see that they funnel also to these bottlenecks. So many raptors, uh, they are, are preferred to fly over land because they soar on up warm up winds and it's it's more easy for them to soar over land where the, the warm wind is, is rising from the ground than over sea where they have to flap more actively. This was also something that was lacking in, in young birds. Uh, I won't go back to the to that map anymore but you might remember that it was a very widespread over the Mediterranean. They just fly, they don't know where they're going, they fly out over the sea but as it seems somehow these old birds, they have learned to, to find these um, uh, bottlenecks. So the, 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 the Suez region and uh, also here on the Eastern side of the Black Sea, the Batumi and then the Bosporus and then over Italy, Sicily. We had also a, a few birds going over Gibraltar. <clears throat> so, we, we have adults and young behave a bit differently. How come uh, they must learn then? I mean, if, if they, if there's some development happening as they age. Um, and 
apparently there's something that happens then between uh, youth and adulthood. And what we then thought was that it must be about learning they, they or they have to train to learn somehow to, to find these bottlenecks or, uh, land bridges for example and and then they then when they have found a, a good route enough as you you still go back to that then then they tend to repeat that over and over again but how do they they find these good routes uh, well here's here's four birds so we as i said actually we put most of our trackers on young birds uh, and uh, for some of them the survivors we had repeated tracks and those are the ones that are in, in bright colors here in, in the and also a bit thicker lines you can also see uh, a few thinner grayer lines but but you try to ignore them um, well, basically, what this kind of perhaps a bit messy, messy, messy map is um, trying to show is that they actually do develop. Uh, we have also calculated statistics on this, but that they, they um, as they age, the the um, migration tracks are less. Uh, they, well, they, they are kind of cleaner. They are less curvature in them. And uh, they also apparently search for for these and find perhaps by accident, but most more likely also by following other birds. That's what we think. More experienced bird, they find these uh, land bridges that, that they wouldn't find on on their own, not necessarily. Um, I won't show the statistics now. I will just show you a graph uh, which basically shows that in different color. Here is the on the left first you have the autumn migration, and here is the spring migration. So there are two things basically you can see. First is that the the <clears throat> the young birds. Well, the young birds are to the to the left in in both of the graphs. During the autumn migration, they uh, are much more um they, they start also later as i said but then then basically already the next time they come back to finland they are using the same timing as as the adults so but in spring uh, it seems this takes much longer for them uh, even up to the sixth seventh eighth uh, calendar year so for some reason the birds start to they migrate back to finland but they don't breed for two or three years perhaps most of them even though they return they just prospect or, or whatever perhaps learn the ways learn learn how to live Asani Boston. and what we think is that uh, in order to kind of learn this correct timing i mean it's important uh, to be back in time in spring in uh, being able to, to, to breed in, in time if you are too late. Well, the Nordic summer is very short, well, then you will fail. And uh, well, here are actually also adult uh, Netherland birds included, but these are the, the Finnish birds, these other ones. Main point being that, well, adults have a, a, a earlier timing, both in adult uh, autumn migration and in spring migration when they leave also other statistics like the curvature as i said and so on uh, and what we it's very difficult to to kind of prove 100 uh, percent with, with this uh, even with this uh, data we have gps tagged birds uh, but we it's almost surely they they synchronize the inexperienced birds synchronize themselves uh, with experienced adults uh, and to, to learn, for, among other things, when to leave, how to find these land bridges, and so on. And this doesn't, this take time. It, they have to do this for many years in order so to, 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 to reach adulthood. But of course, not all individuals make it. We also have had a lot of, of birds dying, uh, both on, on, on migration and on, on site in Africa or Finland and here's a map showing just just a few mortality events or, or 
sites where the mortality occurred with these stars. Uh, here's a photo we got from one bird in, in Nisher, uh, well, in Tilaberi region. But basically what this graph shows is that also the mortality is, is actually very high, almost close to, to 50% when the birds are young. So this is just a linear regression a model applied to these dots, the data. Uh, and, and here is the age of the birds. So only when the, the bird, birds uh, approach a six, seven uh, years, uh, then it settles on, on, a, on a lower level. Before that, there's a very high mortality uh, among the, the animal cells. And uh, well, it's, let, let's say, it, put it in short, this, actually this mortality is extremely high ac uh, according to me and uh, for a bird like the honey buzzard, uh, but a bit a few more other things before I come back to that. Uh, here are also, uh, to other maps of to other birds showing where they died. Uh, the point I want to make with, with these maps, um, and you can also read it in the text, is that actually a lot of the birds die on migration. Almost half of the birds uh, die on migration as compared to when they are local in, in Africa uh, or Finland. And then you have to remember that they are only on migration perhaps during one and a half month uh, during the year so combined for autumn and spring uh, the rest of the year they, they are local in either than finland when breeding or, or uh, in africa uh, during the non-breeding season so relatively much more of this mortality occurs on uh, during migration even though absolutely these percentages says that it's about 50-50, but if you would standardize it uh, to, to how much time they spend on, on migration uh, versus uh, spend being local, then, then you would see that they actually mostly die on migration. And uh, well, many of these mortality events are, are natural. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, about 75 to 80%. Uh, this is also a data set that you would need to be a bit cautious about. But we have tried to infer, and in many cases, we, we know for sure uh, that the bird has died, and we even know why it has died. This bird here to, to the left, it, he died in Western Sahara. Uh, well, people from a local uh, conservation organization went to the site and, and could, could find, find it. And it was actually one of the many birds that died at that time. It was a very huge uh, sandstorm, some sort of Haramatan event and, and, and the birds died as a, as a, on migration over Sahara as, as a, because of that. Here you have the remains of a bird that died in Finland. Well, probably sickness uh, or, 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 well, hard to say, but, but it was not shot or anything like that. A natural reason, this is also a natural reason. This bird, however, unfortunately was shot in Lebanon. And this is something that we have found out from our data happens far too often that birds are shot or also killed by, by humans indi indirectly. Uh, so we have had a, many cases of poaching and also one case with the pole line. And actually uh, based on our estimates about 20 to 25% of all the mor mortality events are uh, caused by man, which is actually far too much for a slow bird species as the honey buzzards. I didn't tell you that, but it's a very, very slow species, reproduces. It doesn't only uh, kind of reach adulthood at a very late stage, but it also reproduces very slowly. At best, it can get two chicks a year, but more, more use, usually it can ha perhaps have one chicks every second year or so. But anyway, uh, by doing this, Tracking of, uh, of honey buzzards, uh, I think 
we can we, what we have learned and some conclusions here to, to the end is that gps tracking is is well, it's a very efficient method to get new knowledge from, from migratory bird species i mean just in in a few years we more than doubled the information for example where where are the wintering locations of finnish honey buzzards in africa as compared to, to ringing of course we got much a lot of, of new completely unique data also nobody knew anything about uh, one thing we were able to show was that wind is a major factor influencing where our birds settle in africa and we all have also been able to to show that uh, well birds de develop in how they migrate as they age they it, it's basically yeah, the root is reshaped uh, by with experience and what we think is that social learning birds simply keep track on other individuals of the same species and follow them and and in addition to wind of course wind is always also there whether as, as uh, i just told you about the bird dying in western sahara as as a cons in, in as a consequence of the, the sandstorm but uh, at least in in order to to reach adulthood so to say what comes to migration timing uh, and, and skills they are almost surely have to to learn from uh, uh, adults and this takes time it takes uh, up to six to seven years or even before they they reach adulthood uh, and until then, the mortality is really high in these species, far too high, actually. Most of the mortality, uh, it happens or occurs during migration. Uh, and unfortunately, even up to perhaps as much as 25%, but 20 to 25% of all the mortality events are caused by man. It's, it's as I also already briefly said, it's most likely much more than a slow species like the European honey buzzard can stand. And um, I think that <clears throat> pretty safely, uh, I, I, I dare to conclude that we have learned that one reason for this very slow uh, decline, declining population we have seen, it, in, it kind of indicates already that there's nothing super dramatic, but it's something that is slowly, slowly, slowly eating off uh, individuals. And uh, probably it is the, you could call it the additional mortality caused by man, man 20, 25% more than that would be a normal. Uh, it's more than, than a, a species could stand. So that was my presentation. Hopefully I didn't went too much, at least over my time. Uh, here are some, some photos from Finland, from, from the fieldwork. Uh, there have been uh, many people involved I can't name them all, tens only in Finland, but also uh, in Africa, I have got to, to learn to, to know people in, especially in South Africa. Uh, and then I won't mention any names, but thank you to all of you, you know who you are. Thanks a lot. That was a fascinating lecture by Dr. Patrick Byholm on the bird that has become a frequent visitor to South Africa over the past decade. In our next talk, we will be shifting from the far-flying migrants to a species that holds its niche in the very southern tip of the African continent. That's right, it's this year's bird of the year, the Cape Rock Jumper. Join Dr. Alan Lee at 3.30 for our final talk of the day on Feeder 2. And while you wait, why not head over to the online shop to grab your bird of the year merchandise in the meantime? We have everything from face masks to fluffy toys and our annual bird of the year pin badges. Go and get yours now and we'll see you at 3.30 to join Dr. Alan Lee to tell us all about this year's Bird of the Year, the Cape Rock Jumper.